Um, okay. So the musician stack. Um, at Warner Music Group, we have uh, thousands of artists, really, um, under an umbrella of dozens and dozens of labels. Um, we've done hundreds of artist sites on Drupal of various levels of complexity. Um, these are a handful of them. You can go check them out. Um, don't judge me based on any bugs you might find here. <laughs> when you're churning out sites really fast and all the time, um, it's sometimes difficult to enforce standards and quality. So that's kind of what this talk is about today. Um, strategies that we've used to try to make sure that all our artists get a, a really cool experience and um, as high quality as, as possible. Um, with the millions and billions of sites that we do, um, there's a handful of things we really needed to accomplish. Um, packaging features is a big one. Um, a lot of people in Drupal are trying to solve this problem right now. There's tons of different possible, as with anything in Drupal, there's a thousand ways to do it. So packaging features, there's a thousand ways to do it. Um, for us, the major problem was that every time we built a site, we would build a blog from scratch. Um, and really a blog is the same on every single site. So all those clicks and it's just too much work and too much money. Um, consistent interface, that's a huge one. Um, once we actually launch a site, we pass it on to support people who are sometimes junior web devs um, and they're not able to dive into code and <laughs> find their way through a crazy Drupal interface. So providing the common admin theme and a common way to get to moderating content, managing users, um, that was huge for us. Um, Company-wide solutions, this is a big one at, at Warner Music Group. I don't know if the small businesses run into this, but I think they probably do. <laughs> um, basically, something changes at 10 a.m. in the morning, and you have to have that change up by noon. Um, something came down from legal, and uh, a terms of service changed, and you, you have to get that out right away. Um, being able to change something like that across 100 different sites in this multi-site farm um, is really important to us. We needed to be able to be really agile in updating our sites. Um, real quick, yeah, we do use multi-site. Um, we have lots of strategies for that. So we have maybe 100 Drupal 6 sites in a single multi-site installation and probably still about 40 Drupal 5 sites in a multi-site installation. Um, we never did multi-site in Drupal 4, but we did have a couple of Drupal 4 sites. And we haven't done anything in Drupal 7 yet, but I'm excited about that. Um, and finally, of course, with any company, the goal is to lower costs, decrease development time, and increase quality of the websites. Um, in the beginning, when we first, you know, ventured our way into Drupal world, every time we did a site, it was like building a site from scratch. Um, pretty much the first time you learn Drupal, you know, you install some modules, download lots and lots of modules without knowing if they're good or not. Um, you do everything by hand, and you basically build a site similarly to how you would have in the olden days when it was just static HTML or, or PHP by hand. Um, this approach didn't scale at all, and I would consider it more of our, our experimental phase. Um, once we did all that, we realized that it's super painful to have to build a site from scratch, and we took our first stab at reusability. This was probably in 2007, so um, approaches to reusability in Drupal were still you know, in their infancy. Um, our strategy, which we called Model Home, was to build an entire artist site with a paid fan club, a tourography, a discography, like every single feature. And then when we wanted to do a new one, we would just export that database, search and replace all the pads, and build from there. Um, it sounded like a good idea, but uh, once you actually try to do it, um, none of our artists ever want to be cookie cutter. They don't want what the last artist had. So they have minor changes they want. And you know, since we're an art company, <laughs> really, we have to support the creativity of our artists. So. We had to let them make changes. When you start with this install, it's like a huge model home. Turning things off or changing things became more work than if you just built the site from scratch. Um, we only launched about two or three sites on model home before we totally killed that approach. Um, and theming, that's the last line on here. Theming has always been an issue for us. Um, in the first one, people would download new themes from Drupal that were kind of close to a layout they wanted and then basically fork the theme. I'm very against forking, just so you guys know. I'll probably mention it several times in here. Um, downloading a new theme was really hard for our junior web devs when they had to fix a problem 
three months down the line and the developer was no longer there and they didn't understand these different themes, um, that was huge for us. Um, we eventually standardized on Zen, so everyone would do a sub-theme, because Zen's a great little theme, but anyone who's ever used it knows that it's super ugly right out of the box. And unless you have a ton of time to style every single element specifically, like tabs, for example, and node links, um, you're going to have a site that looks not quite finished. Um, we basically needed to start with a theme that was a little bit more complete. Um, our second pass at attempting to do reusability was a lot closer um, to what was ideal. Um, basically, we wrote our own custom controller for exportables. Um, you know that exporting content types and views is like pretty straightforward, right? I mean, when you first start doing Drupal sites, you're exporting and importing those by hand, so those ones are easy. Uh, once you get to other things like menu items and roles and all that, it gets a little bit trickier. Um, so. This was about a year of development, and at the end, we had probably 10,000 lines of code <laughs> to support this entire system. Um, and while that's cool, as a software developer, I like code. Um, I work for a music company, and it's, it's really not feasible um, to start positioning your music company as a software development house. You know, you, you just, you don't have the manpower or the, you can't convince your stockholders that you need a bunch of money to write a bunch of code and hire <laughs> a bunch of engineers, you know? They want to hire marketing people and A&R people. So supporting code is a big thing we try to avoid. Um, another thing with this one, since it was so code heavy, um, we do a lot of outsourcing. Uh, we have a really, really small team of full-time in-house employees. It would be probably about six right now with varying skill sets. Um, but we have 20 different dev shops around the world that we work with that we outsource our sites to. Um, so like a single in-house employee would work with like five outsourced dev shops and each dev shop might be doing two to three artist websites. So you see the way that the funnel works. Um, when you're trying to recruit new dev shops, they don't always have the same level of advanced Drupal knowledge. So I can't just throw them into a big old pile of code and say, give me a website in a week because it's kind of impossible. Um, and what they would end up doing is hacking a lot of things and overwriting things. So a big old pile of code was not a good solution for us. Um, and also, no versioning and uh, no controlled overrides on the database level. Um, you know, once you write your modules and you get them into your code repository, you have really cool versioning, but Drupal is such a database heavy CMS that managing your database releases becomes really insane. Uh, we started like exporting databases and doing diffs against database dumps and like really wild stuff that I'm glad we didn't go down that path for too long. <laughs> that would have not been good either. Um, finally, this is where we've ended up. Um, we have a new installation called Crate. Um, basically, it leans on the dev seed stack of modules, the features module, um, context, uh, boxes, a couple other little modules that they've done. Um, they're really focused on exportables. Um, they're really pushing the Drupal community to make sure that when they write a contributed module, they include some sort of APIs or hooks so that you can export that configuration and import it in somewhere. Um, yeah, so anyways, leaning on dev seed modules has been amazing. We don't have to support the code. They release updates more often. I don't have to hire somebody to support this entire huge suite of code. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, the second thing is that there's a, a UI to building the features. So basically, I can have a really junior level CSS JavaScript type person build a whole feature with code and everything, and they don't know anything about PHP. So um, recruiting outsourced talent of varying levels of skill is a big thing that we're challenged with, and having an easier road to making changes to the platform is such a time and money saver. Um, another amazing thing that the features module gives us is override reports and the ability to revert to the baseline. Um, so as we have sites going out the door really, really quickly, we don't really have the manpower to review every single implementation, um, which you really should do in a big company. A lot of developers invent really wild things, you know, infinite loops and string lookups in the database and, <laughs> I mean, just wild stuff. So. Having a, a cool report that we can query centrally to get a list of every single one of our multi-sites and what the current overrides are is just amazing. I can get a, an audit report 
hand it to a developer and say, figure out if any of these changes should roll back into the shared platform, or if there are special tweaks for that artist site, or if we should kill them completely because they were a bad idea. Um, I tried to do that over here in the sweet world, but it was so much querying and just, just bad. So again, the moral of the story is lean on someone else's work. <laughs> Uh, DevSeed does great work, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean on all the modules that they release. Um, another major thing that has helped us in this third approach, um, we created a base theme. Uh, theming in Drupal is oddly really object-oriented. I mean, you can inherit and override, and it's, it's really amazing. So we started with Tau, um, then we went to Rubik, then we have our own base theme extending from there, and finally every artist site gets a sub-theme. So we have these stacks of, of themes together. Um, having a base theme that's on all of your sites is extremely dangerous. Uh, I'm already running into problems. Um, basically, writing backwards compatible CSS is quite challenging. Um, if you make a, a minor tweak to the padding on a, on a storefront, um, you might find out that you have no buy buttons on any of your storefronts anymore. <laughs> uh, that actually happened, and it was drama. <laughs> um, I believe that once we finish the bulk of the base theme and all the standard features are styled, we'll really never have to touch it again. It's not something that should be changing all the time. Once you figure out what your storefront looks like, your storefront will always look that way. You really don't change it too much, except for some artists that are really creative and want you know, immersive flash experiences to shopping in their cart, and then, then you break everything. Uh, Crate. Crate's so amazing that we made a logo for it. It's, uh, it's pretty cute. <laughs> um, exportables. This is pretty much the crux of everything that we do right now. Um, I try to participate at Drupal events as much as I can in the exportable conversations. Um, a lot of things are exportable right out of the box. View, CCK, image cache, menus, variables. Variables is one of the big ones. That basically means if you install a module and then you configure it to do exactly what you want, it's probably just a set of variables. And if you save those five to 10 settings, you know, suddenly your tagadelic always looks good. Um, one big thing I'm using that for right now is packaging an Ubercart installation. Um, if anyone's ever tried to do, we do fan clubs. So if you try to do a subscription with a role upgrade, with a bunch of notifications, I mean, you could be spending many, many hours clicking through all those things and setting up all those features. So basically now we can do it once, capture all the variables, put it into a feature. And obviously each site has a little, little bit different from site to site, but uh, having that starting, I mean, it gets you 70% of the way there, which is a lot of time and money, really. Um, Still handled in code. Uh, we had a really passionate argument about this at DrupalCon, <laughs> the best way to, to tackle taxonomy and roles. Um, those components don't have a, a string keyword machine name. Uh, they're only IDs. So depending on what order you create your taxonomy, you're going to have a different ID every time, and your views are all broken, and it's, it's a major pain. We still haven't solved it. Um, something that we do is edit our modules to kind of check and make adjustments, but it's a little bit ghetto. So I'm hoping Drupal 7 will come out with a solution for this. Um, and if not, maybe someone will hand roll a, a module that can do it for us. Sample content, that's not as important to everyone else, but it's pretty important to me. Um, basically, we'll install a new artist site and then hand it off to a dev shop. It could be a brand new shop we've never worked with before. Um, if it already has news items, photos, videos, examples of all this content, it's so much easier for them to dive in and just start theming. If they have to figure out what all the content types are and where they go, I mean, that's like a bigger learning curve. So I want to install the site and then look at it, and it looks like a fully featured, awesome site, including users and everything. So we have a lot of sample content. So what's in Crate? This is Crate. Um, I think a lot of these components will be similar for sites that other people are doing. Um, I was just looking at, I forget what it's called. There's some suite of features released on Drupal right now that is similar to this. It has a photo gallery, it has a video gallery, it has an audio player. Um, basically, each of these is a different feature for us, and each feature has a ton of different components under it. Um, it does take a lot of attention, making sure that all your features play well together. Um, 
we run into conflicts all the time and we kind of have to get all the heads on it to figure out the best way to avoid the conflicts. But I really think that spending that effort up front makes it so much easier down the road to release upgrades and add new features to sites that have already launched. Um, for example, when we first had Crate, when we launched our first site on it, it was the Black Keys. Um, it only had news, photos, videos, tourography, and store. It didn't have a discography or a community or a fan club. Um, they ended up wanting a discography a little while later, so we built the feature, turned it on, had to write a tiny bit of CSS, and everything was done. It was really like a 30-minute process to add a new feature to an existing live site with tons of users on it. Um, if we'd wanted to do that in the past, what we would have done is take a snapshot of the live site, put it on the dev site, make all your views and content type changes, and then write this really complicated content migration script <laughs> to like pull live content into the new site. I mean, back to this problem of database versioning, content syncs are a nightmare. Um, I have a, I'll talk about that a little more later on. Um, but yeah, so here's the stack of what is exactly in an artist site. So if we picked one feature and looked at what's inside of it, this is a news feature. Um, it might seem like news is a really simple feature. Maybe you could use the story content type for it. Um, but for us, it's, it's a little area. You know, you have, um, you have tags, so you can see what's real popular and trending right now. You have comments that are only about news. Um, the standard recent comments block in Drupal is whatever comments have been posted on any kind of content. Um, what we're trying to do now is when you're in the news section, you can see recent news comments. When you're in the photos section, you can see recent photos comments. I mean, it sounds, you know, simple, but it's really kind of a challenging thing to do in Drupal. Um, so yeah, we take all of these little components and we compile it into a news feature. If I'd done one of these for fan club, it would be really awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's got so much stuff to do a fan club, including your Ubercart configurations. Um, yeah. So, how do we build a feature from scratch? Um, the first step, I'm sure everyone can do. You just build the thing that you would build normally. Now, there's nothing special about it. You make your content types, views, menu, context. Uh, I love context and I love boxes. Um, I love boxes because it's exportable. Um, if you make a custom block, you can't export it and save it in a feature. So I just don't do that anymore. I use boxes. Um, Context, I'm truly, truly in love with. <laughs> I know that the Drupal community has a raging controversy of uh, context versus panels. Um, I don't think it's an either or. I think everyone should run context. I think it's almost as important at this point as, say, Path Auto. Um, it, it's what lets you make sure that your site is super dynamic and has lots of differences on every single page. Um, when we first started building sites, we would do a block stack in the right-hand column that's like some call-outs, some blocks. Um, but if you wanted to have different ones in each section, you have a ton of block path configuration that you have to do to make that magic happen. Um, and if you have content types showing up in different areas, you can't control the blocks. So context is huge for us. And you can run it right alongside your panels and have a really happy relationship there. Um, and finally, performing all your Drupal configurations. That's if you have a certain module that's involved in there. Um, for example, Tagadelic. We use Tagadelic. Um, so I always have to configure that with whichever feature that we're creating. Um, this is what a feature would look like right after we make it. I actually screenshotted this out of Photoshop. Um, what we've started doing is making a, a base PSD that has a page for each of our custom sections and these guides already in here. I don't know if you can see the guides on the, uh... yeah, you can. Anyways, so designers now, instead of making a, a comp for us that vastly differs from the standard theme and requires a ton of CSS writing, they can make whatever they want and fit it right on these little paddings and margins, and it's like ridiculously simple to implement a theme that already matches our layout. Um, one strategy we're taking with this is we made different price points. Um, basically, if an artist wants just a closer to standard layout, they can get it super, super cheap. Um, if they want something really custom, which a lot of our artists do, um, then we just add you know, a couple more thousand dollars on there for the theming work. Um, but this has really saved us a lot of money, having a base PSD people start from. The second step to building a feature 
Um, this is probably the easiest step. <laughs> There's really not much involved until you get to the writing code part. Um, but you build it through the UI, you add components. Um, I'm going to try to show you guys that at the end, uh, but I didn't rehearse that, so it'll probably be a little bit clunky. Um, you export and download your new module, and you write whatever custom code you want in there. Most of the code that we write to our custom features goes into the install file. Um, that's what creates our sample content for us. Um, and some of them we have to do overrides on themes and hooks and interject our way into forms and make little magic happen. Um, it's really cool that a feature is built as a module. So if you're used to module development, you get just as much freedom and flexibility um, building on top of a feature as you do if you wrote a custom module from scratch. Um, the difference being your feature has extra versioning and extra information about it that will really help you down the line. Um, and finally, assets. Um, one thing I want to point out, <laughs> I don't know if any of you have ever built features, um, but if you download it through the UI, uh, I've had trouble where it doesn't pick up my extra assets. If I put images and CSS into the feature folder, um, it, it doesn't know that when it gives you your automated download, it only gives you files it knew. Um, that might be a bug that's been fixed by now, but our current version still does it. Um, this is what a build a feature screen looks like. Um, you can see on the right, these are all various components that we've decided to add into this feature. Um, it's all really cool in jQuery. You can add and remove. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, for someone with a, a moderate amount of Drupal experience, um, this is actually a really easy way to write a module. You don't have to write any code, and here you go, you've got a module. Um, from there, this is what your module, your new feature file stack might look like. Um, I've added the install file. That doesn't come by default. All the other ones, I think, are default. Um, and over here, this is what the module actually looks like. We didn't add too much. Um, we did something to Node API. I'm not even sure what this is. Oh, yeah. With a, a news node, this is an interesting Drupal problem. We want it to say the date that it was posted, but not the author, because no one cares about the author of official artist news. Um, we've actually been tackling this problem like a million times. Um, so now we do it in Node API, which I guess is not super flexible, but it solves the problem. Um, you can see over here a bunch of other features that we're, we've either written or that we're working on. Um, and we do have plans in place to eventually open source a lot of these and make our own feature server. Um, I'm hesitant to do that because it's probably got a bunch of dirty code in it right now. I don't want to release that until it's nice and pretty. Um, but yeah, there's several, several features under development. Um, the final step to building a feature, um, and to me this is the most important, and this is what I'm really trying to hammer home to our developers. Um, you build a feature, and first you have to test it on just a completely blank Drupal site. Um, if it doesn't work on Garland Drupal, then your feature is not worth it. Um, if you can get that going well, then you choose one of your existing Drupal sites you have in the wild, obviously make a snapshot of it, don't do this in production, and turn your feature on, see what happens. Um, a lot of trouble that we run into with this is with the menu system. If you automatically add a menu item, but your live site had a graphically themed menu, now you've got this new link bouncing out to the side. Um, so we have a strategy of nightly builds where we sync all of our live sites onto the most current crate core just so we can test it out and see if it was affected in any way. Um, I'm not sure if that workflow is going to scale because it's really hard to go through 100 sites and test it every time you make a really minor platform change. Um, but again, I think those are things that are going to start getting more solid once our, our active development is done on this. Um, here's a couple screenshots. Um, I built a news feature, and I installed one in a, a crate site that was already existing to see how it worked, and I installed one on a, a Garland Drupal. Um, for some reason, I didn't get my tags block over there, so that's a bug I would have to figure out. <laughs> um, yes. Kit. Um, a lot of people think Kit is actually code or actually a module of some sort. Um, it's really just a document. It's a specification. Um, I went to a really great uh, Birds of a Feather at DrupalCon where we talked about this specific need. 
Um, basically, if people in the Drupal community are going to start building custom features and releasing them, there needs to be some set of standards that makes sure features play well together um, and some way to ensure you're not going to have conflicts. Um, the major strategy is that any settings that you're going to be playing with that are core to Drupal, you put that in your own custom module that's not kit compliant. Anything else you do, like a photo gallery, you would make sure that's super vanilla. Um, here's an example. When I first built the photos feature, um, I put in there that uh, users should be allowed to register for the site, right? Because I figure photos is a community feature. I want users to be able to register for the site. Um, but then I built a videos feature, and I want users to register for the site. And those two features started conflicting because they were both trying to set the same variable. Um, the solution is take all those generic things and put it into one, that's what we call the core settings feature. Um, core settings will never release it. Um, it has secret information in it, <laughs> like uh, API keys to various third-party services that we use. Um, we stash all that in the settings layer. Um, the strategy of using a, a settings feature versus your generic features is something I'm really interested in, and I'm hoping maybe to participate more in the kit project. Um, to explain how we're solving some of those problems. Drush. <laughs> uh, I kind of went really fast through the feature stuff. Did anyone have any questions or thoughts on that? Um, I guess I expected this to be longer than it is, but that's what happens, right? <laughs> um, Drush. Drush is a godsend to us right now. Since we have this like really huge multi-site installation, um, being able to quickly get information from all those sites or change something in all those sites. Um, Drush is what we use to do that now. It lets us, on the command line, figure things out and tweak things quickly. Um, it's also very dangerous, so be careful when you're drushing that you're not clearing cache on a massively loaded site that will then spiral into the ground. Um, one big thing we use Drush for right away, and you know, we could have done this in a, a Unix script, but since we're super Drupal-y, we went with Drush. <laughs> um, basically, this will set up um, a container for you to begin your development. Um, that workflow is something we, we've worked really hard to make it as easy as possible for the developers. Um, so provisioning a, a new site will set up your database, copy your little skeleton folder. Um, in a multi-site setup, everyone has a themes folder, a files folder. And we do this little external trick. Um, I don't know if it's common in the Drupal community, but we have a like an HT access rewrite. So if we want to cheat and have like a blah.html, we would put it in external, and then you can go to my URL slash blah.html. So you can get around having to stash code in your Drupal core. Instead, you can put direct links into your external folder. It's, it's a cool trick that saved us a million times, mostly for splash pages. Um, we stick our splash pages in external, and then everything's lovely. Um, it creates your settings.php, and it creates a, a symlink, so you've got a vhost. Um, from there, in Drupal 6, you still have to go back over to your web browser and install the site by hand. Um, choose your appropriate install profile. Um, in Drupal 7, there's actually a Drush command that lets you install Drupal on the command line. I'm looking forward to that. I would love if someone would backport it to Drupal 6 so that I can never have to Basically, I want one command, like new artist site, and then I send an email to the developers, and then that's it. I'm done. But uh, this takes about 20 minutes. I want to get it down to two minutes. Once you've got the site installed, there's a second Drush command we have to run. This one generates a sub-theme for us. Um, generating the sub-theme has been so wonderful. Um, basically, when I, I give developers a site, um, and they hand it back, and I get this crazy theme folder with lots of template files, with lots of PHP logic in the template files. Like, I shudder to think about supporting that a year later when I'm not friends with those developers anymore. <laughs> um, so what we do is we have a sub-theme that creates like three files and a readme. Um, it doesn't create an images folder, although I think I should probably do that. It doesn't create a JavaScript folder. Basically. It's an attempt at encouraging you to not stray outside the lines too much when you're building a theme. People still do, but it, it is a good little starter. Um, and our sub-theme, our base theme, there's a light version and a dark version. Um, if you've ever done a Drupal theme, if you have a black background and like a dark interface, 
there's so many styles that you need to change to get your forms and your links to look good. Um, so we have a light base and a dark base and we'll basically look at the comp, make a decision about which one it's closest to and, and whip up a little sub theme. Um, and then it commits everything to the repository after it gets your theme going. Um, other benefits of Crate. Um, the starter PSD has been huge for us. Um, earlier on in our Drupal work, um, the marketing people would be the ones that built the wireframes. Um, and once they mastered OmniGraffle, um, they went crazy. We would get wireframes that were like 100 pages long. Um, and there would be like a little block with a tiny little note that says, when you mouse over this block, it should slide down and fold in like 10 new views. <laughs> so basically, if you want to actually build their wireframe, you have to like comb through it like really detail oriented and highlight all these changes. Um, so there's like a huge problem with defining features in your wireframes. Um, so I just wanted to kill wireframes entirely. I don't even see why we need them. If we have a starter PSD that represents all the elements, it can kind of work as a wireframe and it helps your designers. Um, so people are very uncomfortable with this change, but we are transitioning into it and wireframes will be a thing of the past. Um, best practices, that's such a loaded term. Um, but once you've got some cool like A, B testing strategies and actual raw data that you can use to say, your album call out should be at the very top of the page. You don't want your album call out way down here. You want it way up here. Um, then we can use our base theme and our default installs to just show people this is the best practice. This is what you should probably do. If you want to stray from this, you need a really compelling business reason to do it. Um, content sync, like I said, this one's huge for us. Um, we have a whole world of sites that are totally custom and we can't predict the content types and fields at all. Um, whenever we want to pull one of those sites into the fold, you basically have to go from scratch, pick apart the database schema, write a totally custom script, and copy your content over. Um, Sean on our team refers to it as being a database surgeon, essentially. I mean, you have to really know what you're doing. Um, it's about eight hours of work to migrate a special site into a, a new build. Um, once we had Suite, that at least had common content types for every single site. Um, so migrating from Suite to Suite was pretty predictable. Now that we have Crate, it's got super standardized features. Um, so going from Suite to Crate and Crate to Crate should be a little bit easier. We should only have to have two scripts that we have to maintain. Um, if anybody has any questions about Content Sync, I can answer those later. That it's it's really a big problem. Um, it's another thing that a lot of Drupal people are trying to, to tackle. Um, and back to the consistent interface um, issue. We really have different levels of support. It's not like a traditional software company where you have level one support and level two support. We have actual fan support, which is they have, they have no technical skills whatsoever. They don't know anything about code. Um, and they just handle whatever the fans throw at them. Those people need to be able to manage their Drupal sites and they need to be able to answer questions for the users. Um, so they were getting really mad at us when every single Drupal site that we launched had slightly different tweaks to the features because they couldn't help the users. Um, so having just a, a standard implementation has cut down on support costs too. Um, one thing that gets really dangerous once you start standardizing and um, enforcing and all those things is uh, people feel like you're killing their artistic freedom. Um, I love art and I want everyone to be able to innovate. Uh, so messaging to people that you have all these standards but you can still break the mold if you want to, um, that's been really challenging. Um, we're trying to figure out a good way um, of providing people examples of different ways they can innovate. One of our artists, Foxy Shazam, um, they didn't want a, a column sidebar type site. They wanted trays with jQuery that slides down and things come in and out. And I was like, we can totally build this on Crate. So we made a sub theme, completely overrode everything in the base theme, used all the same views, the same content types, pulled them in and made this really cool site that looks nothing like our standard PSDs, nothing like the default install. Um, it's now one of our showcase sites. So when an artist says, I don't want your cookie cutter website, we can go, look at Foxy Shazam, it's amazing. <laughs> so if you guys want to check that one out, um, it's pretty cool. Uh, 
This is actually my last slide, so I've gone 35 minutes. That's, that's more than I was expecting. Um, this is the big question. This is, I hope, the reason why you guys are in this, um, and that's how will I get rich. Um, basically, if I wasn't working insane hours for the man, <laughs> um, and I was still pursuing entrepreneurial things, um, I would use features um, to make bundled solutions. Um, stores and e-commerce solutions, uh, an example would be something like uh, Shopify, I think. You can basically log in, create a new site, it's there for you, and it's done. Um, using strategies of packaged features and maybe writing a little bit of code for a, a custom user install, you can write a solution like that fairly simply on top of Drupal. Similarly, do-it-yourself social networks like Ning. Um, if you package together all your community features, you can write a Ning yourself. Software solutions for businesses, that's something I would love to do. I have no end to solutions I want to give businesses when I see them being inefficient. Um, an example is, say, doctor's offices. Um, patients want to be able to get their lab work online. They need a secure implementation. They need secure pages configured, all that. Um, if you solve it once and you build it once, you can package it and then go to all the doctor's offices and sell it and be a millionaire. <laughs> Um, the last one is churches, cities, clubs, things like that. Um, I've seen a lot of uh, Drupal sessions about churches. Um, I know that it's a common, Drupal is a common solution for the church website problem. Um, I think now that we have features and we know the solution, we can just bundle it and really everyone can have a, an amazing solution for free, really, if you want to be open source or for money if you want to be rich. That's it. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes. We actually are using DreshMake. That's a good question. <laughs> we have um, Crate has an install profile, and it has a Crate.make. Um, I love the DreshMake strategy. Um, basically, what we do in there is we have one file where we list all the modules that are required um, for this installation and their versions. Um, you Drush make it and it downloads everything. We actually apply patches to the core. We write our own patches and put them in our repository. Um, it's really made, like, like you know when you get a module from Drupal and it doesn't do quite what you want and you know if you just like edited that file it would be wonderful. That's called forking. That's something that makes me very uncomfortable. But if you write a patch and you put the patch in a repository, then it's not forking. Um, and Crate, uh, Dresh Make has a million solutions for cool stuff like that. Um, it also integrates with like tons of different repositories, SVN or Git or whatever. Um, so there's actually a little danger with that. Um, every time I get that little red alert that says, your modules are no longer secure, you must upgrade. Um, I just edit the crate.make file, change the version, and every single one of the sites will get that new module upgrade immediately. I guess it's similar to how sites all modules used to work, but it's, it's more like you have a schema um, stored in this file of what modules you're using right there. Um, a problem we've had is if you need to run update.php after you install that module, um, doing that on 100 sites in like five seconds before anyone notices, that's a little challenging. Um, so we tend to kind of roll through it in chunks. But yeah, for anyone that's never used Drush Make, uh, it was I was really nervous about it when I first got to it, but uh, after about a month of like picking apart the module and figuring out what it did, I, I just totally love it right now. So, anyone else? If you want to, like, say, add a new field to an existing content type. So what you would do is you'd edit your feature, commit it to your repository, launch it, whatever. All your live sites that already had that feature on, when you go to the features page, it'll show you. Actually, let me just get out of here so I can show you what a features page looks like. When you go to the features page, it'll show you what overrides you have in place on it. Um, I don't know if I have any overrides here. There you go, so here's one that's overridden. Um, so the moral is, <laughs> any live site that you have won't just instantly pick up the new field. It's not going to be broken. Um, it's basically going to assume that it's in an overridden state, and it's going to wait for you to do something and say that you want it to pick up that new change. Um, you can 
revert um, a, a site to the baseline um, with a dresh command. So when I want to push this field to 20 different sites, I could just run the dresh revert command on it on every single site, and I don't have to actually log in. Um, but looking at the overrides, um, it's pretty cool. It shows me, okay, my context is overridden. Um, what that means to me is that somebody moved blocks. Uh, that's not a big deal. I'm, I'm okay if you override block placement, so I would not revert this one. Um, but yeah, if I released a new field, it would show up right here, and I would say, okay, revert this guy. So again, this is managing features is something that more junior level people can do. Since you don't have to go in the code, you don't have to know Dresh, really. All you have to do is come to this page, look at your override, and revert it. Yeah. Anyone else? All right. Well, thanks for your time. <laughs> this will be posted online when it's done.